Hi, my name is David Allard, elected president of the Seminar Métis Association. I'd like to thank uh, the college for facilitating this today and for their involvement in Louis Riel Day over all these years. And uh, more importantly, I would like to acknowledge our presence on the Sequetmec traditional lands. November 16 is Louis Riel Day. This was the day he was hanged in Saskatchewan in 1885. The factors that led to his execution are many and complex, but the ideals that Louis Riel came to symbolize are timeless. He is generally recognized as the most important Métis leader and the father of Manitoba. To this day, his actions to help the Métis people gain recognition of their rights to their lands and way of life has been part of an ongoing struggle. The struggles and obstacles faced then and now have been lived and shared by many. This commonality of experience is part of what it means to be Métis. The Métis nation has at its core a connecting and sharing of values and ideas. By coming into existence through the mixture of cultures and ways of life, the Métis are an example how we can all benefit from looking at what ties us together in a positive way and how our differences are to be celebrated and allow full expression. By defending the Métis existence, Louis Riel, in my opinion, was also a defender of those notions. A way of life that respects the opinions of all and tries to settle conflicts and disputes through negotiations represented the Métis until their struggles pushed them to the breaking point. As a man, Louis Riel was very human and had many flaws as we all do. What has stood out through time is the symbols that he represents. The symbols of equality, justice, perseverance, and respect. The biggest cost for pursuing these Timeless goals for Louis Riel was his life. Let us remember him as a man that was involved in our shared history as a leader that still helps us with remembering that to overcome injustices and to live in, with integrity, we must each decide what price we are willing to pay. On that note, please take some time on November 16th to remember Louis Riel and perhaps even learn more about him. I thank you for allowing me to share these thoughts about a man who continues to inspire men. Merci, Miigwech. Good afternoon, uh, my name is John Sayers. I'm a Region 3 Senator um, for uh, the Métis Nation of British Columbia. Uh, we're on the Shushwap or Sequentmec territory. Um, I'd like to thank you and welcome you to our, our little gathering. Uh, it's a strange time now because of this COVID stuff, so we can't gather like uh, we, we really like to do. Uh, we like to be around people, we like to feed people, we like to have our meals, we like to listen to music, we like to uh, share our, our stories with the children. So we're really missing it this year, so um, it's for me it's very important and, and I, I'm, I'm really happy with this opportunity to, um, to share with you. So. Caroline invited me to come and talk to you and ask a little bit about the Métis people. So uh, I'm a senator for, for the Thompson Okanagan area. I spent 20-some uh, years working in the school district with our youth and, and uh, a lot of the students from the college and stuff will know who I am. Um, it, to me, it's very important to get our, our um, story out there because growing up, I wasn't allowed to know about who I was or about my ancestry. So it was pretty late in life. I was in, in my late 20s when I found out about my Métis ancestry. And um, for me, it's been uh, very rewarding and it, it answered a lot of questions. I, I understand who I, where, where I came from and, and my, uh, my heritage. Um, I, I got invited to a, a a gathering up in Fort St. John with the Métis people and I thought that that was going to be a really important and, and uh, 
pretty neat thing because I was going to get to go and meet some elders and see and learn a little bit about my culture. When I got up there, I found out that it was just like visiting with a bunch of cousins. Um, we went to a dance that night and it was just like going to a family wedding because I already knew the culture. I didn't know that that was culture, but I, I did recognize um, a lot of the, the, um, the, the step dancing and the fiddling and the, and, and the stories and stuff. So uh, I've been involved with the Métis for um, over 30 years now and, uh, and enjoy my time um, doing presentations and, and talking about the Métis people. What's important to me is to get some of these stories into the education system because I think we are the forgotten people. We're forgotten by both of our cousins, by the Europeans and the First Nations people. So they're just now learning again and, and getting our stories out there and getting to know who we are. And I think that's very important. Um, Louis Riel, Louis Riel um, in my family played a pretty important a part because we were part of um, his story, uh, going back to his father. His father represented my grandfather in the, in the fur trade. Uh, we, he would sell furs down in the United States, and when he came back across the line, the Hudson's Bay Company arrested him and charged him with illegally selling their furs in the United States because they figured that they owned all of the, the animals and the furs, and they had a monopoly in, in Canada. So um, they took him to court, and 300 Métis surrounded the courthouse and, and said, let him go. So they, they uh, broke the monopoly on the fur trade, is what, is what happened. It's a, it's a pretty neat story if you look into it. Later on in history, because those two grandfathers worked together and, and, and had that, that, um, that, that uh, belonging, uh, it, it affected my life right down to today. Um, because in, in those days, if you were a part of a crime or anything, you, uh, you were ostracized even within your family. So I had um, grandfathers who were charged with treason. Someone was charged as a cattle thief. But you know, I found out what what that all meant and stuff. So it caused a lot of um, shame and alcohol and, and anger and resentment and all kinds of things within my family. So in finding my ancestry, that really helped and and uh, made things make sense. I understood what was going on. So Louis Rial for me is, is a very important, played a very big part in my life, very big role in my life. Um, I, I understand his story. One thing Rial said was he would, that his people would sleep for a hundred years and uh, it would be the artists that would, that would awaken his people and bring them back together. So the fiddlers and our painters and our, our, our artisans, um, the bead work, you know, the flower bead people, we're, we're known for many things. So uh, I have a lot to be proud of, and I think every Métis has a lot to be proud of. Um, and I think it's really important that we get, you know, some of this put into the curriculum in the schools and have our story told so we're not forgotten people anymore. And uh, I want to thank you for uh, spending uh, a few minutes with me and, and uh, listening to uh, me share some of the stories and some of the things that I've done over my time. Uh, my name is John Sayers. I'm a senator for Region 3. Uh, they're changing senator. They're going to call it uh, something else now, meaning the old ones. I am very proud of, of what, uh, what we've accomplished here in San Arm with our local and our, you know, our, our, uh, our recognition, our, you know, to, to uh, be standing here in a university when you've only got a grade three education, uh, is, is pretty um, scary, it's, um, but it's also pretty rewarding that um, we now you know, are, are getting a, a bit of our recognition and getting some of our stories told. So, um, happy Real Day. Okay, we got the Métis flag here. This is uh, one that we fly uh, for Louis Real days for many different things. We have a couple of different kinds of flags. We have the blue one that's uh, flown in the time of peace. We have a red one that we take into battle with us. Uh, what it is, is it's uh, two circles. They're joined in the middle. So it's also the sign of infinity. And so it stands for uh, Métis forever. And it's the white side of our family and the red side of our family. They're joined in the middle and Métis go on forever. So um, this is the uh, flag that's been adopted by the 
by the Métis um, nation. Buffalo hunting was uh, a big part of the Métis people, and so I brought a buffalo skull to, uh, to share. And this is a big animal, this is a big, big animal. So, um, you know, you can imagine to go and poke these things with a sharp stick because that's what a lot of the First Nations had to do. They didn't have guns and, and things to, to harvest these. So one of the ways they used to harvest these was buffalo jumps. And so um, what they would do is, is uh, they were smarter than the animals, so they would um, corral them and, and, and learn to move these, these herds. And they learned to do that because they watched the herds and in amongst the herds, there was always wolves and coyotes. And the, the buffalo were so big that they weren't worried about buffalo or a little wolf or a little coyote. So what the people did was they took the hides of a, of a coyote. These uh, buffalo didn't have real sharp eyes. So they would put the buffalo hide over or the, the wolf skin over their shoulders and they could sneak right up and get really close to the herd. And when they would get up close to the herd, that's how they used it to steer the buffalo. And they would steer the buffalo over a cliff. And then at the bottom of the cliff were a bunch of rocks and things. And the people would go down there and that's how they harvested them. They would chase them over the cliffs. There's a big um, a buffalo jump in uh, Southern Alberta, Fort McLeod, I think it's called, um, head smashed in buffalo jump. And so that, that has a really interesting story too. Yeah, so this piece here is a, a Red River cart. It's, uh, it was used in buffalo hunting. It uh, probably carry a th at least a thousand pounds of buffalo and uh, hides and meat. Uh, it was towed by one ox or one horse, uh, or how it was towed around. When they traveled, they didn't travel in a straight line like a train, they traveled in a V. So when they came across the prairie, um, the prairies were very dusty. And so uh, nobody had to eat dust all day long because they only traveled like five to 10 miles would be a really good day uh, of traveling. And so if you know how big our country is to travel across that prairie at five or 10 miles a day, uh, you're not going very far, very fast. So, um, but they were a, a good um, um, machine, a good uh, way to travel because there's no glue, there's no wood, there's no, I mean, no, no wood nails, nothing holds this together, it's just plugged together like a, like a little um, puzzle. And so they would put uh, the buffalo meat in there. If you came to a creek or a stream or a river, you could pull these wheels off. And so you could just pop these little pieces out of here. And you could take these wheels off them down they would go underneath the cart like this and they'd be tied there like that and this became a raft and so you could raft stuff across the river and when you got out on the prairie there was no hardware store to fix things so if you had to repair it um, you just took one cart for parts and you could repair a bunch of them so what would happen is you would pull these pins here plugs together and you can pull these two pins here and you can see it all starts to fall in pieces. So you can see that it's a, it's a pretty inventive and ingenious little vehicle. They wouldn't put any grease on the wheels, like uh, on the axles, because like I was saying, the prairies are very dusty and the uh, grease would have picked up the uh, dirt or the grease, made it like sandpaper. It wore off your axles and uh, a cart with no wheels isn't much good to you. So uh, it was a pretty ingenious little vehicle. It's part of Canada's history, but um, we don't need it anymore. So it kind of just gets lost in our, in our, in our history. Um, this is a Hudson's Bay blanket. It's um, still made um, over 500 years. It's been made still in the same place in England. Um, if you went in and you wanted to know how much a blanket was in the old days, you could see by these little marks on the blanket. 
It's a three and a half point blanket. So what it meant was it would be take you three and a half made beaver to be able to buy this blanket uh, in, the, in, in the old fur trade. Because they're wool, uh, they were very, very comfortable. They were very warm. Even if they got wet, they were, they were, um, they were used in the, you know, as, as a, a, a traditional dress. I've got the capote on. It's made from the Hudson's Bay blanket. It's um, it's really warm. Um, it was made of wool. It was made out of the Hudson's Bay blankets. Uh, I have a sash around my my waist. I have my canoe cup. I'll explain that in a few minutes. Um, but it's it's part of um, the traditional dress of the Métis people. So um, in the paintings and, and things like that. You know, we're here to celebrate Riel and stuff like that. But a lot of people don't even know who the Métis are. The Métis are the mixed bloods, the, um, the, the, the people in between. So we European and, and First Nations. And we have cousins on both sides. And um, at one time, we were very important because we're the interpreters. We were the ones that are go-between. The uh, Hudson's Bay Company needed us to be able to bring the uh, people in, to bring the furs in, because they were hunting for furs. They were looking for furs. That's how they built the Hudson's Bay Company. So um, I have a great grandfather, if you did some research, you'd find out I have a great grandfather who broke that monopoly on the fur trade because the Hudson's Bay Company always thought that they owned Canada. So um, the, uh, the fur traders and stuff, they would go out and they'd catch their furs. My grandfather would go collect them up and he would take them down to the United States, this imaginary border at the 49th parallel that somebody put there. Uh, and he would sell his furs down there because he could get three times as much as what the Hudson's Bay Company was paying. So um, when he came back across the border and, and into uh, what they called Canada, or up then it was the Northwest Territories, he was arrested and charged for illegally selling the Hudson's Bay furs. And so he was taken into court, what they called the court. It was uh, probably the chief factor of the, of the fort that uh, was the judge. Anyways, he. Uh, was taken in there and, and was going to be charged for illegally selling their furs. 300 Métis, armed Métis, surrounded the courthouse and said, let them go. You have no right to do this. We have, you know, you don't own these, these, these uh, animals or these pelts or anything else. So what, he was found guilty, but he, there was no penalty imposed. And then it broke the monopoly on the fur trade. So um, I'm very proud of, you know, a grandfather that stood up for what he believed in mm -hmm. and, um, said broke the monopoly on the fur trade. It meant that if they're going to trade with us, then they had to be fair. We were here before that border, so that border doesn't really affect us. It does today, but uh, it, it, it didn't exist. We were here long before the border ever came into place. So you have a blanket, and it was just uh, thrown over your shoulder. You could carry your gunpowder, your, your shells, your lead, your different things. So. Just an extra pocket for you. I have many, many pictures, some of the old ways. And this is some of the things from the clothing. Uh, this is, explains about the sash. Um, some of the different uh, moose hair tufting and, and embroidering with colored thread and stuff like this was some of the makings of the Métis people. Uh, you can see that like to decorate their clothes and a uh, dog um, saddle or, or whatever. It's a dog blanket. Uh, Morrison's leggings. Here's a saddle. My tea saddle. And there were some some famous Métis too. Um, this is uh, Louis Riel's mother. She was the first white woman this side of um, Ontario. So, here's the man we're celebrating, Louis Riel. Louis Riel was a pretty interesting guy. He uh, was sent to a convent for school where he was going to become a priest. So when, but when he started using that in his, his talks and stuff, then the people started mocking him and calling him a, a prophet and, and different things. But he, he used his education. I mean, he was educated amongst the priests and stuff. That's what he knew. 
There's the Red River cart, the original Red River cart of uh, that, that uh, you know was pulled by a horse and didn't have no race cars in those days because they could only go about five or ten miles in a day. So there's that. Got some pictures of some script. It'd be an interesting topic if somebody wanted to to learn something about the script and what that meant. Uh, it was meant that they would give you this piece of paper. It's supposed to be good for uh, 240 acres, but the 240 acres might be swamp. I didn't know until until after. So land speculators and things um, were uh, pretty crooked. We didn't uh, we didn't write the history, so those stories aren't in there. Um, this one here is uh, got my grandfather's name on it because he that is the story I was telling you about breaking the monopoly on the fur trade. So this is a group of um, people who are freighting across the prairie and stuff. That's a group of Métis people. These are just some of my carvings. So um, this little guy did a, a carving of a. A voyager and he's got the pack on his back so they were packing they would pack um, hides like buffalo hides and beaver skins and they would pack them all down into little bunches and then they would haul them in uh, in uh, freight back so they would haul it by canoe or by uh, red river cart or by york boats so um, it's just a little carving that i did I was teasing my brother-in-law because he's from Saskatchewan, so I called this guy Sass and Sass catch one. It's uh, when we talk about fishing, so it's Sass catch one. And then the drumming, the music. Well, you've seen some of our uh, musicians a few minutes ago, so um, music and and and. Uh, the heartbeat of the drum was something that was very important to First Nations people, Métis people. The drum, when it's played, it's the heartbeat of the earth. So when, um, if you put your hand on your heart, you can feel the thump, 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 thump. So um, that's what the drum is doing. It's the heartbeat of the earth, and it's, and it's to bring things together. There's another thing under here that was very important, and a lot of people identify First Nations people with the feather, but a lot of people don't know the story of the feather. You know, if we go back a long time ago to those people that were coming across the prairies, um, there were no planes or trains or automobiles or anything, so they observed the animals, and when they watched the animals, they watched the eagle, and the eagle could fly so high that it disappeared, so they didn't know where it went, but they knew Creator lived up there. And so if the eagle went up to Creator and talked to Creator and came back to Earth, and if you were to receive an eagle feather that had been that close to God, that was a very special gift. It was a, an honor. So when you did a good deed or when you did something uh, that was honorable, you would receive an eagle feather. And to do that, to receive an eagle feather is, is a great um, uh, honor. So it's a coveted gift. And so this one was given to me uh, when I retired um, from the school district. So I, I cherish that. It's something very special to me. And these are these are a couple of carvings uh, that I made. They're talking sticks. So when we would go in to um, meet with the kids, we would take these in to show the kids um, and show them how we conducted um, our, our uh, meetings. And some, if we had something really important to talk about, the talking stick might come out. And whoever held the talking stick was the speaker. Everybody else would listen. Um, so you had the right to listen. And so I made it into a fish walker. But um, it it's, would be passed around the circle so that everybody got a say. Nobody was left out. Everybody in the circle was important. There was nobody that was more important than anybody else. And so the talking stick was something that we used to uh, to um, control uh, meetings so that it didn't get out of hand or anything. So a uh, talking stick was uh, part of uh, the traditional culture for, for many different uh, bands, tribes, uh, nations across our, our uh, Great Turtle Island. So 
I don't know if you can see them. This is Chief Big Bear. Uh, he was the last chief in Canada to be put on a, on a uh, reserve or to sign a treaty um, uh, out on the prairies. This is Poundmaker. He was a peaceful one, um, but uh, both of them were arrested during the rebellion because of different things. Put in jail, had their hair cut, had to uh, swear to become a Christian in order to be released. So there's a, a pretty neat story, but um, they're very important chiefs from, from around the time of Louis Riel. Um, Louis Riel was corresponding with them. He knew that the, the people were starving, the government was withholding rations and, and food from the people, so um, they thought they, if they uh, worked with Riel, they might get a better deal. Um, so uh, all of that's part of our, our history. Tanshikio Wow, Lisa Andriku, Dishina Kashin. I'll be dancing to the Red River Jig by the Metis Toe Tappers. Just 
Keeps walking through the shadows of my 